Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Shahram Akbarzadeh. I'm the convener of uh, Middle East Studies Forum at Alfred Deakin Institute, Deakin University. I'm delighted to host this uh, conversation with an uh, esteemed uh, panel uh, of discussant uh, looking at what's happening in uh, Ukraine and the implications for the Middle East. This discussion is recorded, and uh, once uh, we have the recording, it will be put on uh, the MESIF YouTube channel, so you'll be able to access that. Our panelists, um, in the order of appearance, and we are hoping that our middle panelists will be able to join us in time for this talk, but the order is we have Dr. Anissa Van England, who is Associate Professor of International Security and law at Cranfield University in UK. And this is main area of research and practice are human rights law and humanitarian law with a focus on the Muslim world and expertise, especially on Iranian affairs. As an expert on international law, Anissa often runs training sessions uh, for international organizations and civil service. Then we have Dr. Sadr Ziba Kalam, who's a professor of political science at Tehran University and one of the most prominent public intellectuals and political analysts in the country. He is the um, author of a number of best-selling books in Persian, including How Did We Become What uh, We Are, Hashemi Without Polish, Tradition and Modernity, and Introduction to the Islamic Revolution. And last but not least, we have Dr. Nikolai Kujanov, who's a research associate professor at Gulf Studies Center of Qatar University. His research focuses on the geopolitics of Gulf energy, Russian foreign policy in the Middle East, as well as Iran's economy and international relations. Dr. Kujanov has been a visiting fellow at a number of leading international think tanks, uh, including Chatham House, um, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and Carnegie Moscow Center. Obviously, the um, events in, in Europe, in Ukraine, have been devastating for the population, for the regional dynamics in Europe, but also for what happens in the Middle East. And in order to uh, discuss that, I am delighted to invite our first speaker to talk to us about the, the implications of the war in Ukraine on the local politics of the region, especially, as you know, many of the uh, states in the region um, subscribe to the authoritarian mode of government. And the question is, does this mean that authoritarianism is going to be bolstered and encouraged by Russia's behavior? in Ukraine. So, Dr. Anissa, if you don't mind, I'm going to pass over to you. Thank you very much, Shahram. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to be back to your program and to be with all of you today. This is the advantage of the pandemic, if I may put it this way. We've basically brought down barriers and I'm actually sitting here in Paris where I'm taking my break, but I work in the UK and I'm now talking to you uh, located around the world, mainly in Australia. So that's fantastic. So uh, your question is actually really relevant in terms of what we tend to do uh, very often in academia, but also uh, in the media, is to view the conflict in Ukraine from our perspective. And our perspective is that this is a fight for democracy and that you are either a pro Russia or pro Ukraine. And this is not exactly how the country in the Middle East or in Africa, by the way, have actually engaged with the conflict. They see things differently. They are basically wondering how are they going to address, how are they going to handle. Russia. And it's going to have a different impact in terms of security from them all. So, for example, Turkey could feel very much threatened because the aim of Russia is, of course, to control the Black Sea. For other countries from the Gulf, uh, and I think Nikolai will address that later, since from a short term basis, well, we are financially benefiting from the crisis. So it's far more complicated than you are with us or against us. What certain, is certain is that the Russian presence in Ukraine uh, 
the Russian war in Ukraine is going to have an impact on the Russian presence um, in the Middle East. So in terms of authoritarianism, we are seeing a shift around the world. It's not just uh, the, the, the manifestation is, is perhaps Russia with Ukraine, but it's not the only one. We're seeing it around the world. I mean, in France, Le Pen uh, was uh, is, is like 8% from being a president of the Republic, 8% short uh, votes. Uh, so we need to realize that there's a rise of authoritarianism everywhere. What is particularly interesting with the Russia uh, in conflict that has been brought to Ukraine is how authoritarianism has taken a new international shape. So this is a consequence, basically, if here I speak in legal term, what we have seen as lawyers in 2003 with the invasion of Iraq. So the fact that the United States used international law to violate international law, it was actually hypocrisy, justifying the reason for invasion on the basis of the United Charter, basically paved the way later for Russia to test the ground, test the ground with the invasion of Georgia, then the invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and a second time now, but also with its involvement in Syria. So what we are basically seeing is that all the narrative, this liberal narrative agenda that was holding us together was actually undermined by the Americans first. And that has empowered authoritarian regime. So what we have seen, for example, is with the 2003 invasion of Iraq, how, how it has benefited Iran, which is imperialist agenda of expansion. So that's one example. So there have been different elements in the Middle East, different actors such as Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, that have felt empowered by the fact that the United States has moved away from hard power to try and embrace more soft power shortly followed after that by the European Union. And so when all those actors found themselves in Syria, it was a sort of repetition for Russia, for Ukraine, but for the other countries of the region, it was also a test, a test of the global north will and military ability, financial capacity to enter in conflict. This was tested again, if you think about it, in 2019, the summer 2019 with Iran, where basically the Americans were growling, Trump was growling at Iran, but nothing really happened. So what we have is that we have regimes that feel vindicated. They feel vindicated, they felt vindicated throughout the last few years, but they feel vindicated also with Russia basically pointing the finger at something that the global South has been talking again and again about, which is that we are applying international law in a way that's always favoring a group of states and always as at the expenses of the other state, especially with the human rights narrative. So of course, this is going to have an impact on authoritarianism, which is that now there is less shame in terms of affirming, well, I actually don't care about democracy. I don't care about human rights. I have a completely different agenda. Uh, so that would be the case of the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's the case of Turkey, which is still on the verge. So when the foreign minister of Russia, uh, Lavrov said, well, let me explain to you the conflict. Replace Ukraine with Palestine. Replace the United States with Russia. Think you're in Africa. Well, it's the same thing. What's the difference? And in that sense, he speaks to two forms of colonialism, the Russian colonialism versus the American colonialism, that eventually use international law to push forward what is an authoritarian, authoritarian agenda. Now, of course, what can be discussed is the shape of that authoritarian agenda, the comparison that the minister established here is actually not correct in terms of methodology, but I think we get the gist of it. I think also what we need to realize is that there's been an arm race in the Middle East around the world that started five years ago. So why do I say five years ago? I actually work in a very military environment. I train public servants, I train the armed forces around the world. And when I started the job, we were always asked to deliver training on human rights or humanitarian law. Those were countries that were post-conflict and that were trying to engage, that were, well, they were, they were trying to sum up what had happened in terms of humanitarian law and trying to engage positively with human rights to build sustainable peace. And so we did a lot of country in the Middle East and the countries in the Middle East were either the first one to drop the human rights lecture and to ask for acquisition instead. So what is acquisition? Is everything that's around weapons. So they wanted to know more about how do you buy weapons, 
what's the rule, what are the rules, how do you basically match your military capability to your ambitions? So if it is to defend yourself, what exactly do you need in terms of weapons? And so this is also the result of a dynamic that's been established by China and Russia, where they've established a sort of transactional way of selling weapons, which is, well, actually, we don't really care about human rights and democracy. So that is how the genocide of the Rohingya, for example, was basically done using Chinese weapons, or what happened in Sri Lanka uh, was done using Chinese weapons. So all those weapons that Russia has sold to Iran, Russia has sold to Egypt, Russia has sold to Algeria, were done in a way that were not respectful of the constraint that Thales Bay systems that are based in the global north would follow. And that is, of course, a way of creating a connection between Russia and Iran, uh, China and Sri Lanka, which is supportive of authoritarianism. It's a way of saying, well, actually, all your restriction and limitation about human rights, we don't care about them. So we're really seeing a curtain that's being drawn. And what Donald Trump did not understand with his sanctions, for example, is that Iran had become a pivotal state in that regard, and that the Iranians could have been more on the fence. And instead, my view is that we really pushed the Iranians, we led the Iranians in the arms of uh, Russia and Palestine, or at least a few of the leadership. So what I'm saying here right now is that the liberal, the liberal framework for peace and security that we normally use is under threat. It has been under threat since 9-11. If you want to analyze one of the consequences of 9-11, it is one of those. So there is now ethical and legal tensions around the need to defend democracy, human rights, but also self-determination, because what we're talking about here is an imperialist agenda of expansion, is about self-determination, and states that might actually, like Ukraine, say, but actually we want to be sovereign. That's what the Ukrainians are saying right now to Russia. So what we also need to take into account uh, is that we're in a post-Arab Spring environment in the Middle East. There's a lot of governance instability. And the question is, how would we sort out that governance and stability? For a lot of states, the easy answer is authoritarianism, is actually being more severe with the population, especially now that we are going to have a lot of food insecurity uh, because of Ukraine and that we probably are going to have food riots. So it's not going to be a time where states that are already unstable from a security perspective are actually going to encourage freedom of expression, through demonstration and elements like this. And so that, of course, raises the question of the US leadership in the region, which is, well, who can provide security here and now? So if we are uh, in Libya, who's going to provide food security? If we are in Jordan, who's going to provide food security? Well, if the Russian have the ability to provide this, their leadership will be preferred to one of the United States that has actually been tested through decades and has not brought much with discontentment. So we can see the UAE or the Saudi Arabian grievances towards the United States. So in that regard, Russia is offering a viable alternative in many, many ways, providing a different security model, providing new governance perspective, a new shift on geostrategy, geopolitics, a new perspective on international law. And all this means that what we are going to see is if Russia is successful in Ukraine, will be a lot of appetite in the Middle East to do a mini copy of Russia or actually to feel strengthened by Russia. So my conclusion here will be basically about the Israeli position. A lot of people have said, well, we are actually quite disappointed with Israel. We've provided all those weapons and now they're not sharing the weapons with the Ukrainians. But why would the Israeli do anything since the Israeli are occupying Palestine, which is exactly what Russia is seeking to do with Ukraine. So actually, Russia could legitimate the historical narrative that the Israeli have tried to establish in terms of authority over Palestine. So I will leave you with this, since Lavrov is making hazardous comparison, please allow me to make hazardous comparison as well in that regard. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Anissa. That is a fascinating start to our conversation. Um, I really like the comparisons you're making between uh, what Israel is doing to Palestine and what Russia is doing to Ukraine. Uh, I think there's plenty of questions to come back to uh, on that and other points. I'll be save questions for later once we're all finished. 
I'm glad to see Professor Ziba Kalam online with us and the connection seems to be holding. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Ziba Kalam to reflect on what the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions put on Russia means for the nuclear deal negotiations in Vienna, which apparently is on hold uh, indefinitely now. Professor Ziba Kalam, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am honored to be amongst uh, uh, you distinguished uh, uh, academic. What has been uh, the effect of Russian uh, invasion uh, in uh, Ukraine on uh, prospect of uh, uh, nuclear uh, negotiation between Iran and the West? Let me begin by saying that there is a new approach by the United States vis-a-vis the, the, the Iran's nuclear crisis. It appears that there is a sense of pragmatism amongst the, the, uh, the new US administration, which means that uh, they have realized that uh, despite uh, more than uh, more than 20 years of uh, heavy sanctions against uh, Iran, the United States has been uh, aiming uh, three uh, basic uh, strategic um, aims in uh, uh, in Iran. Its first aim was to limit to slow down Iran's nuclear uh, progress. Its second objective was that as a result of sanction, Iran's missile development to be hampered. Its third aim was that, uh, again, um, the, the through, the, through the sanctions, uh, the influence of Iran's revolutionary guard to be cur- curtailed, to be slowed down in the region. Now, none of none of these, uh, none of the Americans' uh, three um, three uh, basic uh, strategic objectives uh, have materialized despite um, two decades of sanctions. Iran um, has moved faster as far as uh, progress in uh, in her nuclear program is concerned. Iran's missile program has been uh, moving uh, rapidly uh, during the past decade or so. And thirdly, and finally, the influence of uh, Iran's revolutionary guard, Iran's military presence in region today is much more stronger uh, than what it was 10 years ago. Iran is uh, present in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, whereas 10 years ago, Iran was not very much uh, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Iran did not, did, did not exert any influence uh, or, or rather much influence in these regions. So that means that uh, Biden administration, either President Biden himself or some of his aides, they have realized that carrying on the policy that we have been pursuing during the past two decades is fruitless, is useless, because it's getting Iran, Iran's uh, nuclear program is getting, is advancing, uh, revolutionary guard is getting uh, stronger and uh, stronger and Iran's missile program is uh, is rapidly making progress the only consequence the only results of us sanction has been uh, hampering Iran's middle class Iran's middle class has been suffering as a result of uh, economically politically socially as a result of the uh, United States the sanctions against against Iran, that has been the only the only result of the 
of more than two decades of sanctions. So, so the United States is pursuing a new approach towards Iran's nuclear program and negotiation. They have been ready to give some concessions to Iran in order to make peace or, or rather to, 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 to sign an agreement with Iran. Of course, uh, there are two sides of, uh, of this issue. One is the United States and the West. The other side is, uh, is, is Iran. Iran's radical win of, uh, the, the, of political currents, they have become much stronger during the past decade uh, or so. As a result of this new development, they now control all the three branches of the government. Now, unfortunately, there is no consensus amongst the radicals in Iran. Some of them are ready to, to make a peace and to make similar concession and to reach a deal. The others, they are not. They want to pursue anti-Americanism um, and, and the export of the revolution and, and the radical uh, uh, ideas, et cetera, et cetera, that they have been, uh, that they have been uh, uh, um, actually portraying uh, and advocating since, uh, since the Islamic revolution. Now, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it was very much welcome in Iran by the radicals because they thought that, they imagined that there would be a quick victory for Putin, which he, who is the main ally of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And as a result, Iran can gain more concession uh, from the West as a result of the Putin's uh, victory in um, the, uh, Ukraine because of the suffering of the Ukrainian people. But, uh, but the dream of, of, uh, of Putin has not, uh, has not materialized and, uh, uh, and the Russians are getting deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble. And there is no, there's no immediate victory outcome for, uh, for Moscow. That has helped that has helped to soften Iranian radicals' uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the West. At the beginning of the U.S. invasion in the, of Ukraine, radicals, they have become much stronger. And they were saying that no, United States must, uh, must obey, uh, United States must give in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, but since, the Russians were stuck in uh, Ukraine, the radicals, their tune has softened a great deal because they realized that they no longer can rely on, uh, on Russia and use the Russian card uh, in their negotiation with the, with the West. Now, many Iranians have given up hope of any deal uh, any compromise between Tehran and Washington. But I still have plenty of hope for a subsequent uh, agreement uh, between Iran and the West vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear issue. In other words, I haven't given up hope at all. And because of the development uh, in Ukraine, I think it has helped in a way a more moderate and more pragmatic uh, the approach uh, from, um, from Tehran. Thank you very much. And I hope <laughs> I managed to put, uh, to, to shed some light on, this, uh, on these complicated uh, issues. Thank you so much. It is indeed complicated, but uh, you have really helped shed light on uh, some of the perhaps lesser known and little known aspects of uh, the dynamic, especially from the uh, perspective of Iranian uh, leaders, and whether hardline or reformist. I'm also very pleased to hear that you are still optimistic about the prospects. So it's good to be optimistic and bring some hope into conversation. Now, 
again, uh, there will be questions to ask, but I'm going to go to our uh, last but not least speaker, Associate Professor Kujanov, um, who would be talking to us about the, the impact of price hikes. Uh, as you know, the, the conflict in Ukraine has led to increases in oil and gas prices. Uh, a number of Gulf states are uh, oil and gas producing economies. So uh, this is obviously going to impact them, but how is the question? So Nikolai, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Akram. And I also need to thank you and Daikin University for bringing me in this discussion, which is very timely and very interesting. And it's my pleasure to share my views. Overall stage, uh, economic stage, is set out by two important political factors. First of all, it's the factor of unpredictability. Because right now we know the fact of the invasion, but we don't know what kind of scenario is going to unfold in the future. And for sure, this will be determining certain reaction, and first of all, economic re reaction on the part of the Gulf states, and on the other hand, also will be determining the depth of uh, the impact of the overall crisis on their economies. So, for instance, if tomorrow we see Russia stopping, uh, there it is and starting the, the peaceful negotiations, we might see certain end up of the sanctions escalation, which will definitely uh, create a certain stability and predictability in terms of how the United States can interact with the global oil market, uh, oil and gas market, and with Russia itself. On the other hand, if we see the uh, continuation of escalation, definitely this will be absolutely different picture, including greater instability and unpredictability in the oil and gas market, with probably much more lucrative opportunities for the Gulf states to enter the European market as well. But that's something that we'll discuss later. Second factor, which is also important to keep in mind when we are talking about the Gulf states and their interest in oil and gas markets, is connected to the fact that for them, uh, this conflict is something which is happening far, far away. So they do not have any ideological uh, or uh, life matter interest vested in this conflict. So for them, it's more like an event that can, of course, bring quite a number of challenges, but it also creates a certain opportunities that they are thinking how they can profit from. And from this point of view, of course, at the very first approach, we could say that uh, this uh, situation uh, that currently is unfolding in the oil and gas market globally creates quite a number of opportunities for uh, the Gulf states and, first of all, for the GCC players. First of all, of course, high oil prices and high uh, natural gas prices, they are helping these countries to restore those losses, I mean, financial losses that they had while coping with the COVID crisis, COVID created crisis, and while coping with the uh, consequences of uh, shale uh, revolution uh, slightly before it. These financial inflow also helps to strengthen the uh, uh, very base of the soft power of these states, uh, money that they can later be used for so-called checkbook diplomacy, when definitely certain positions in the region and outside of the region can be strengthened through the uh, certain investments. And we always see uh, the GCC states helping, for instance, the Egypt government to manage the crisis through pouring money in the central bank of Egypt. We also see them saying that now they are ready to invest money in the uh, vulnerable countries of the region as well. And that definitely also creates a certain opportunities to transform this inflow of money into the political leverage. Third, um, but also quite important, that desire of Europe, or better to say the bigger West, to help the European Union to diversify their dependence on oil and, first of all, gas supplies uh, on Russia, uh, also creates a very important opportunity for uh, the regional players, and for instance, for Qatar, to renegotiate the market conditions that exist for, for Qatar gas in Europe. So we should keep in mind that definitely uh, the priority market for the majority of the uh, Gulf players is in Asia. And it's not only because of the usually high, high prices or high demand and the uh, belief that, correct belief that uh, the main demand growth will be associated with Asia on hydrocarbons in the era of energy transition. But it's also because of the uh, existing heavy market regulations in Europe. 
that do not allow uh, the Gulf players to solve their hydrocarbons. And first of all, we're talking about Qatar, as I mentioned, uh, on the lucrative conditions. But right now, the current crisis allows uh, the Gulf producers to speak to the Europeans and to the Americans as well from the upper position. And it helped them to negotiate better conditions, not only politically, but also economically for their activities. And finally, uh, of course, the advantage that is created by the current situation is definitely the increasing niche in European market that could be uh, uh, filled in by uh, the GCC states in the future. Of course, while saying that there is an opportunity for them to enter the Europe European market, we need to keep in mind that it's not going to happen immediately and right now. There are natural limitations. But given their uh, ambitious plans, both in uh, terms of increase in oil and natural gas production, these countries will definitely help Europe to diversify its dependence on, on, on Russia in the long run. But at the same time, there are, of course, certain challenges that are created by the current situation. These challenges also need to be uh, kept in mind when we are talking about uh, the Gulf. On the one hand, even though uh, for the Gulf states, the um, fallout of uh, con connected to the increase in the uh, fuel prices is not that important, probably uh, when it comes also to food security, uh, even with their dependence on uh, the imports of food products from Ukraine and, and Russia, I'm speaking about grain naturally, uh, these all uh, should be considered as manageable, but still the impact of lack of access to fertilizers to grain, as well as the cumulative effect of the rising fuel prices on the uh, whole pro pro on the prices of other products, will definitely be felt and be, should be considered by the Gulf economy play planners. Not to say that, of course, Gulf is not the GCC countries all, only. We have Iraq, we have Iran, and from Iranian uh, angle, we will definitely see a far uh, more deeper impact uh, of uh, the current. Um, market instability uh, in different areas than when it comes to uh, the GCC states. Uh, not to say that high oil prices are not always uh, good, uh, because it's always a precondition for a certain market overheating and the further instability. And especially if we see the continuation of the European allies of Ukraine, the further instability of, of the market should be taken as granted. And this instability will definitely always create a certain negative options like the unexpected fall down in oil prices, like the overheating of the market and the economies that are inevitably should be considered as a challenge for the Gulf states. Second, when speaking about the, the, the situation in uh, the Gulf economies themselves, we should also understand that to a certain extent, the current crisis is also a moment of truth. The GCC states has, all, has been uh, talking about their existing and future plans on the increase of their production capacities for quite a long time. But there are still quite a number of questions whether they are actually can uh, deliver on these promises, at least when it comes to uh, Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates. And of course, now the world is expecting them to be more active at the oil market, but the question is con connected to the fact whether they can do uh, this or not. And finally, uh, for them, it will also be quite important to uh, play a Russian and American card. So on the one hand, uh, they are trying right now to squeeze as much as they can in terms of the preferences from the West. But at the same time, they also should be mindful about the timing in order not to overpressure their vis-a-vis -vis and not to make them look for other alternatives. And on the other hand, they should also be careful uh, with playing the current game with Russia, where they are now still associated being more pro-Russian than pro-Ukrainian. And this is also an extra um, political challenge, which is associated with their unwillingness to right now go into the battle for the market just because they don't know how the conflict in Ukraine is going to end up. But in the long run, and that's where I would like to stop, we'll definitely see them exploiting this situation for their profit 
more than dealing with the risks. And most probably uh, the future uh, map of oil and of global oil and gas market will be redivided and the share of uh, the Gulf players will substantially increase. That's where I would like to stop and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Nikolai. Fascinating presentation. And uh, I always thought that higher oil and gas prices would be good for oil and gas producing economies, but you're actually challenging my assumption. So thank you for that. All right. Well, the floor is open for questions. We'll go to the next question. And that's Michelle. Go thank ahead. you, Haram. And uh, thanks to all the presenters. I really enjoyed listening in to you. Um, I've got perhaps a, a question for Anise more than, um, and it's more probably a general question, but I was struck by your um, finishing um, reflection about, you know, whether we can see this um, comparison if Russia is successful in Ukraine. I think there are strengths in uh, making that comparison with Israel and Palestine, but I can also see severe dangers. So I'd like you to perhaps tell us a little bit more where your thinking is coming from, because if we have Palestinians, I think, in this room, um, they might have a very strong case against making that comparison for obvious reasons. But I, I would like just to know a bit more where your thinking is coming from, please. Thanks. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to expand on this, because it's, you're right, it's absolutely needed. So I'm coming at it from a historical legal perspective. So what the Israeli have said is that they've refused to apply occupation law to Palestine uh, on the ground that actually they're not occupying Palestine and that Palestine is historically part of Israel. And so what we see is similarities with the narrative of Russia, big brother, small brother with Ukraine, that Ukraine is actually nat naturally part of Russia. So I was coming at it from that perspective where we have a long history put forward by the Israeli in terms of legal interpretation of the law of occupation and the dramatic consequences that it has had basically on Israel non-compliance with the laws of occupation. I'm also, by the way, not saying that Ukraine is occupied. Ukraine is not occupied uh, because the Ukrainian themselves refused that terminology. They dealt with it uh, for the Donbass 2000, after 2014 in Crimea 2014 because they had to find a relevant word. But even today, they insist on the fact that they have a well-functioning state that's paying pensions and everything. So, Michelle, thank you for, for, for pointing that out because my wording was even wrong in an Ukrainian context, not just in a Palestinian context. So I'm establishing here a really broad comparison uh, that would be historical legal methodology and that would need refinement. So thank you for calling me out on it. Sorry, I just wanted to say that I'm very interested in your work, Anise. So if you can email me some of the stuff you do on, on the international legal argument, I would be really interested. Thanks. Okay, great. Great networking. <laughs> great networking. All right, Ian, are you okay to go ahead? Sorry, I'd just like to raise an issue for all three panelists that uh, wasn't mentioned in the uh, discussion that uh, we've just had, a fascinating discussion, which I enjoyed very much. Um, it's really the, uh, the UN General Assembly vote on the 2nd of March, where most of the, uh, uh, of the states in the Middle East actually voted um, in favor of a resolution uh, 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 that was highly critical of the Russian action in invading Ukraine. The only ones that, that weren't was Syria voted against, obviously, but even Iran abstained. Um, the, the, most of the, the others actually voted in favor. Do any of you see the, 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 the views of uh, Middle East states as having changed in the last two months, given that we're now two months since that uh, General Assembly vote? Uh, because at this stage, back in March, it was very highly critical of Russia. And uh, it would have been, I think, very disappointing uh, for Russia, particularly the, the Iranian uh, abstention and uh, the fact that they really didn't do better with, with some of the other states. So, so first of all, um, definitely the, the war dynamics, uh, it affects the strategic thinking uh, in the Middle East. And uh, again, I'm mostly speaking about the, the GCC area, because initially uh, what uh, happened in Ukraine, it was perceived by uh, the Gulf decision makers through the prism of uh, the Syrian conflict. 
So the main idea was that it's going to be quite a short military campaign that will end up with a victory in the end. And that's why uh, the, the Gulf states were not interested in, for instance, immediately jumping in and saving the energy security of Europe as well, apart from existing, uh, obvious existing infrastructural and production limitations. They just didn't want to, to uh, spoil the relations with Russia that still remains, for instance, an important player within OPEC plus. And they didn't want how to, 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 to ruin the discipline that was carefully created during, within the last couple of years within this organization. Right now, they see that situation is not going going exactly in the way how Russia uh, most probably uh, planned. And uh, now they are trying to readjust. Second, uh, we should also give a tribute to the Western and Ukrainian efforts. So we see that, uh, first of all, uh, the European diplomacy, probably not always successful, but still it's trying to push through the idea that the Gulf states should reconsider their position. And right now, for instance, Germany is offering quite an appealing package of uh, economic uh, incentives to, to Qatar, for instance, to be more on the side of the West, to be more on the side of Ukraine. Not to say that the Ukrainians themselves, they're they are quite active. And for instance, Doha Forum that took place uh, lately this March became de facto pro-Ukrainian. Uh, with the President Zelensky giving his speech with his uh, deputy uh, foreign minister attending it. And this definitely is shaping the public opinion. And finally, which is probably, uh, uh, well, contradict to what I was saying before, uh, the, 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 the Middle East states, they are trying to uh, balance between Russia and between the West. And from this point of view, they are voting, uh, be it a positive or abstaining, I wouldn't be considering as a uh, pro-Western move. It is rather a certain signal that, yes, we are ready to talk on this issue. But at the same time, uh, they are still doing business with Russia. Um, even Qatar, I mentioned, uh, it, of course, gave a guarantee that there are not going to be any new investments in Russian economy but it still remains one of the largest investors in the Russian economy. And it's not going to withdraw immediately the Western, the, the flight of the Western capital. Mm -hmm. So it is a kind of, uh, I would say, an intricate political game where the moves in favor of West, they sometimes on the ground counterbalanced by the moves of the, uh, in favor of Russians. Thank you. Anissa, would you like to also respond to that? Very quickly, but from a different perspective. Sure. So that will complete actually uh, some of Nicola's view. So I work very much with the UK government. And so uh, when I'm sent on training, I'm sent by the FCDO and the MOD. And we started selecting our destination based on the outcome of the votes. So it's very much this pro Ukraine movement where uh, UK is expected to support Ukraine, uh, UK is yeah, expected to support Ukraine. So I'm not going to give you the names of the countries, but based on how they voted, some of the training has been cancelled or postponed, meaning that the UK is diplomatically trying to influence those countries for future votes so that they vote the right way. That's interesting to note. Thank you for that. Okay, so. Uh... Now we move to our next question, and that's Neda. Go ahead, Neda. Thank you for uh, the beautiful, uh, you know, speaking all the panels. And uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Ziba Kalam, and it's about Iran power in the region. Do you think the Russia's invasion in Ukraine will increase Iran power, you know, generally in the region? Primarily, that was the case, as I explained in my, in my talk. But since uh, Russia appears to be a stock and they don't appear to be near a military victory, no, um, the Ukraine and, uh, and the fact that uh, Russia has, has, has become heavily stock in uh, in Ukraine uh, I think uh, it it, uh, it doesn't help let's put it this way Neda it it hasn't helped at all uh, the hardliners in in Tehran can I ask a follow-up question to that uh, professor Ziba Kalam um, do you think um, the hardliners will uh, take stock will really learn from this experience? 
uh, and try and find perhaps a compromise or a middle ground in their talks with the West in, on the nuclear program, because up to this point, they have constantly been referring to China and to Russia as their allies, as people, as, as states that they can rely on to counterbalance Western influence. But now with this, fail, the Russian failure of actually invading Kiev and they're falling back, um, do you think that's going to cause hard learners to rethink their, their grand strategic view? Yes, Professor Akbarzadeh. Uh, hardliners are increasingly facing two realities. The first reality is that uh, we cannot rely on Russia uh, as much as we used to because of, because of the situation in Ukraine. Now, the second reality is that hardliners are increasingly realizing that for China, the first objective is not ideology, but economy. They're realizing that Chinese ties, economic ties with Saudi Arabia, with Gulf state, with the state of Israel is much stronger than what it is with, uh, with Islamic Iran. So they, they have enough sense to realize that Russia, is, Russia will not Russia will not forsake, Russia will not sacrifice her economic interest in these countries for the sake of supporting Iran. Mm -hmm. So these two realities are, uh, are in fact uh, going hand in hand in weakening the position of the hardliners. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Now we have another question. Anissa, you're asking a question. Go ahead. Yes, actually a question to my two co-panelists because they're expert on the topic. Before I go ahead with my question, hi, Dr. Zibak Qalam, I have to tell you something. You have a strong fan base, fan bases at home. So my mom wanted me to tell you that she loves you. Okay, so that's done. That's the Iranian <laughs> mother. My mom's Iranian. Okay, so that's done. I've done it. I promise I would do it. Great. So there you go. My mom loves you. <laughs> she thinks you're great. So to my two uh, co-panelists, we see a lot of discussion around the sanctions and the impact of the sanctions. Um, and now we're starting to see uh, experts who say, well, actually, the sanctions did not work in Iran. So why would they work in Russia? Uh, and so here we have an expert on Iran, an expert on economy. So I think it would be interesting. What do you think about this? Do you think that's a valid argument? It won't work with Russia? Because Ukraine is very much focused on having those sanctions implemented. Let me, let me say that, please, uh, please uh, give my salam <laughs> and my return love to your, uh, to your dear mom. Now, this is not, not only a networking opportunity, but also a family <laughs> gathering. <laughs> yes. Now, the point is that there are two crucial differences between the effect of sanctions on Russia and that, than what it is with Iran. That crucial difference is that uh, Russian economy is much more involved with the world trade, with the world economy. Russia's uh, export of uh, oil and gas to Europe, Russia's uh, the, the wheat uh, export, Russia's uh, fertilizer export, etc., etc. So it means that uh, when it comes to the sanction, because of the Russians' heavy involvement as far as export is concerned, as far as trade with the with the, with the rest of the world is concerned, is much more um, spread, is much more extended than, than Iran. So if you sanction Iran, Iran does suffer, but not as much as a country uh, which is too much involved on an international uh, Level. So because of that, I think there are differences and, and Russia would suffer much more than Iran as far as uh, um, the ultimate sanctions are concerned. 
Thank you. Nicolai, do you have something on that point? Uh, yes, um, I mean, several points. First of all, um, I agree with Dr. Zibakalam um, about uh, the differences in the economy size and the integration. But we should also think, uh, think about sanctions as a double-edged uh, sword. So on the one hand, indeed, uh, Russia can suffer and suffer deeper than maybe uh, Iran in certain cases. But I, I need to, to, to remind that Russia is one of the largest producers of phosphates, uh, one of the important players in the nickel market, and also quite an important player in the food market. So it can basically shatter, and it will shatter it if it's needed, the fertilizers market, uh, the market of metals necessary for grid energy transition, and it also can create certain um, disturbances in the uh, food supplies. Uh, it might happen not because of uh, Russia will want to, 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 to strike back, though we already see uh, it's trying to do this, but just because of the disruption in the uh, financial channels of um, uh, support of the economic uh, operations, just simply because as a quite a number of states will not be able to pay for the export of these materials. So that that's, that, 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 that's why I guess uh, I cannot completely agree with uh, my colleague. Uh, indeed, sanctions will be sensitive, but um, I would say that the understanding that Russia can strike back in certain areas will might uh, will make I would say the um, uh, uh, Russian opponents think twice about whether they should go directly with the uh, paramount. <laughs> or there should be a certain time given before the next, uh, proceeding to the next step. Second, uh, the main difference between Russia and Iran that the uh, uh, Russia is still being threatened by, let's say, those sanctions that all was imposed on Iran. And what we see right now, it's more about the panic that Russia will be completely cut from oil market, that Russia will be completely cut from the gas market, but not the fact that Russia cannot export the, the, the uh, oil and gas. And the second, th uh, third thing, uh, I honestly, after the, uh, those sanctions that were imposed on, on, on Russia, I started to understand the, the Iranian economy better <laughs> by experiencing on my personal, in my personal life, I say, all those limitations that were imposed. Uh, and what we see right now, uh, we see just the first wave of impact of sanctions on Russia. So it is just the instability of the um, uh, macroeconomic parameters uh, caused by the necessity of the Russian economy to readjust to new realities. And like in the case of Iran, and we are just repeating almost the same situation with Iran, it will take a year or two, most probably two, to get readjusted and uh, to be able to live under the sanctions, but probably not to develop. What's more important and what Iran can be used for Russia as a um, way to predict what can happen further on is actually the second wave, which is connected with the undermining of a uh, country's capacity to develop its production base, just because of the lack of finance and access to the new, te to the new technologies. This impact usually takes time to be how say, understood and to, be, to become obvious in terms of in impact on the economy, because the de deterioration of the production base demands time. In case of Iran, it already happened. In case of Russia, it might probably take five, six, seven years before we'll see it. But we already can say that Russia, as a leading oil and gas player, is probably doomed in terms of losing its capacities and in terms of losing its um, positions in the global market, oil and gas market, from within the five, 10 years perspective, which will definitely affect the way how the Middle East will be seeing Russia and will definitely affect on how the Middle East, including Iran, will be willing to deal with Russia. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Arash, were you trying to raise hand? You need to unmute. Yes, sir. How are you? Go, Thank go you ahead. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. Um, my question is from Dr. Zibakalan. Um, I was wondering the, the Russian challenges in Ukraine, the impact of that challenges in Iranian team in Vienna, how does these challenges change Iranian team dynamics? I explained to some extent uh, about your question in my uh, 
um, in my talk. Obviously, obviously, you cannot expect Iranian negotiators in Vienna to say that, oh, because Russia uh, has been stuck in Ukraine and uh, we, we relied and, uh, too much on Russia, so we're going to make a U-turn. Obviously, they won't say that. They, they, if you ask them directly, they will tell you that uh, it has nothing to do with our negotiation, uh, whether, whether Russia would win eventually uh, and have a military triumph in, 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 in Ukraine or, uh, or vice versa. It doesn't affect. But psychologically and internationally, it's bound to affect uh, uh, the, the position and the orientation of the negotiators in, uh, in uh, Vienna. Because uh, in a way, uh, Russia and China has been supporter of Iran uh, during all these years of negotiation over the nuclear uh, uh, issue. Now, as I said, uh, now the, the, the one of the, uh, one of the <laughs> psychological ally of, uh, of Islamic Iran has been a stock. So it is bound to affect the position of uh, Iranian negotiators in, in, in Vienna. It, it will soften their attitude and, uh, and will help to reach um, the, a quicker, uh, um, a, a quicker uh, agreement. I have a question, and that is, I think, um, for everyone on the panel, it's probably the elephant in the room. There have been references to the United States um, and the United States standing. Uh, I liked uh, Anissa's point that there is no shame in not wanting to be democratic. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Uh, in a way, um, Russia has made authoritarianism acceptable publicly. So what does all of this mean for the United States? Um, you know, when Russia invaded Ukraine, the US for obvious reasons did not want to engage directly. They, are, they don't want to be engaging in a nuclear conflict. So uh, they, they're supporting Ukrainian army uh, they're sending troops, they're sending funds, but not intervening directly. How does this look um, for the U.S. global power if you're sitting in the Middle East, in one of the Middle Eastern capital, capitals? How does this make the U.S. look that is fighting a battle with one hand tied behind its back? Um, is this a good look? Or is this a look of a restrained global leader or a look of a weak global leader? Um, so I wonder if the panel could reflect on that. Perhaps I start with uh, uh, Anissa, since Anissa brought that question up uh, initially, but then I'd like to hear from everyone at that point. Thank you. Yeah, I tend to be a little bit negative, don't I? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, my job is not exactly uh, all unicorns and rainbows, especially at the moment. I work a lot with Ukrainians, so it's a bit difficult not to be influenced by the mood. Um, so it's 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 an important question. So I've recently worked, as I said, in Ukraine. I was also in Sudan. I was in Mali, Nigeria, and Morocco, uh, in Palestine. Uh, those are the most recent one where the U.S. leadership is actually being questioned. I'm gonna move away a bit from the Middle East and go to the city of Khartoum. So in Khartoum, you have all the big players that are physically there that have reinforced their diplomatic presence. Um, so uh, I'm thinking the Russians are there, the Chinese are there, everybody's there. Uh, and it's a city full of spies. Khartoum, can you believe it? It's become a city full of spies. We always speak about Vienna, Paris, and Istanbul. Actually, Khartoum is a hotspot. Uh, and the Americans have built a huge, um, a huge embassy outside of Khartoum, which strategically demonstrates exactly what I was saying earlier. It's this desire of the American to take a step back, even physically, which means that during the riots in Khartoum, the Americans were sitting out there in their big compound, not at all affected, while the Brits were trying to find ways of protecting the embassy, although the embassy already looks like a bunker in Khartoum. Uh, and that really, for me, illustrates what the United States is doing right now. 
the, the reason why I was referring to all the countries before is because when I worked there, the feeling was like the US is not strong enough anymore. And that this policy of restraint or const well restraint is actually a way of hiding uh, weaknesses. And that Donald Trump was the um, part of the iceberg that we could see that symbolizes those weaknesses. It's a country that's internally divided and that is not actually able to project power anymore, mainly because of its failure in Afghanistan and in Iraq. They perceived that the country would financially not be able. So there's another country that I'm not going to mention that I did not on purpose because, of course, I operate in the Chatham House rules when I teach, where they told me if we are invaded, we have exactly, we can stand 24 hours. We can keep the enemy at bay 24 hours before the Americans arrive and the British arrive. And I was like, will they come? And they were like, no, they will not come. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they would have come to our rescue. Now we are on our own. Uh, so again, it's this American desire and the EU desire to step away from hard power uh, the fact that we've depleted our forces, if you look, for example, today, if we were to engage with Russia on a military basis, Shahram, you sp speak immediately about the nuclear, because all the other options that are supposed to normally militarily lead to the nuclear are depleted from our perspective. So we are basically unable to even lead an operation uh, elsewhere. And that's the result, of course, of spending a lot of money in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Again, I said I was going to be very negative. It's a bit the nature of my job. So I'll stay quiet. And hopefully my colleagues will be more optimistic. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Life is not all about unicorns. That's okay. <laughs> Especially life in the Middle East. Um, Nicola, would you like to reflect on that, on the American standing? Well, a Russian speaking about the Americans, it's quite predictable what you can hear from that. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking here. Uh, well, definitely, I, I would like to raise the stakes and to say that actually I would consider the uh, Middle Eastern vision of uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict through the lenses of their relations with the Americans, or better to say with the West. Um, definitely in the Gulf, there is a huge, huge disappointment with the United States and their reformatting of their presence in the region. And while the United States remains a key ally, at least officially stated, there is a huge attempt to diversify uh, political and economic relations, and that's for sure. So, and moreover, uh, we could say that different vision of the domestic uh, dynamics in the United States in different Gulf states affects their approaches. So on the one hand, we have Qatar, which is extremely concerned that as a result of the next parliamentarian and presidential elections, it will get in the United States forces in charge that are going to be less pro qatari so as a result, we see Qatar trying to build up closer relations with the United States in order to make a deeper embedded in, in the US foreign policy, just in case that any other force uh, that will be responsible for decision making process in the States will not be able to take it out of this picture. On the other hand, uh, we have Saudi Arabia that is waiting actually for these elections and that is considering the current situation as a certain minor revenge if we are talking about Mohammed bin Salman with regard to, uh, um, uh, to uh, President Biden. And as a result, interestingly, of these two different calculations, we don't see uh, both of these countries being in a hurry to help uh, the West to diversify its, rely, um, its dependence on uh, Russian oil and gas. Uh, Saudi Arabia wants to trade more preferences to it. Qatar is not sure whether it should spoil relations with the Russians because it doesn't know what's going to happen in the United States again uh, after, see, after the next um, uh, election cycle. So, and as a result, we see uh, uh, the Middle East being disappointed, trying to build up relations with the Americans, but at the same time, trying to diversify politically and economically which making them less reluctant to stay in the first row of those who are associated with the defenders of the American interest in the region and beyond. Thank you, Nikolai. Professor Ziba Kalam, would you have something to add on that point? Very brief uh, uh, reply, or rather respond, and that is 
United States suffer in the region, if not worldwide, uh, as a result of her uh, catastrophic departure from Afghanistan. We all, we all observe. N no one believed that the United States would, would rather leave Afghanistan uh, in, in, in a superpower would behave uh, uh, so miserably. And I think, I think the war in Ukraine, it has, uh, it has very much repaired the, the international uh, and moral damage that United States uh, incurred uh, during uh, her disastrous departure from Afghanistan. So you you saying that the U.S. has actually gained credibility for the way it's Oh yes, dealing? yes, definitely, definitely, because the world can see that uh, you see um, you see Professor Akrazo that the world has a sympathy for uh, Ukrainian people, um, not only for the Ukrainian people themselves, but there is a grudge against Russia uh, as a as a dictatorship, as a ruthless dictatorship. Now, anyone who could help um, the war in, in, in Ukraine um, on behalf of the Ukrainian people would, would gain, uh, would gain um, moral uh, recognition. And that's what United States is exactly doing. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I think if there are no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank our uh, panel of experts for their fascinating take on the conflict in Ukraine and how it impacts the Middle East um, politics and international relations. Please join me in uh, thanking our speakers virtually. <laughs> uh, you will all be on our mailing list. So we are going to have another session on the 2nd of June. Uh, and you will receive notification regarding that presentation. But until then, stay safe, stay well, and thanks very much for being with us. Thank you very much uh, for having me and having us. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.